The buildings rose abruptly from the far end of the orchard. Tall, straight, closely knit apartment houses rising against a rapidly darkening sky. The road was lined with curious civilians streaming toward the railroad bridge to see the fabled Americans, forcing our jeep to progress at a snail-like pace along the narrow road. The narrow chasm formed by the towering buildings was darker than the open orchard, and the early evening wind whistled around us. The streets seemed deserted compared to the mass of people who had lined the road through the orchard, but here and there a group of civilians stopped to stare at us, and some to wave cheerfully. I was relieved to see them, for we had come to know that where there were civilians there was usually no opposition. Whitman directed the jeep driver to the police station, an imposing three-storey public building which, with its surrounding grounds, occupied an entire block at the end of the street. A tall iron grill fence enclosed the grounds, and we drew up to a gate in the fence where two Germans in uniform stood guard. Civilians appeared from every direction and crowded around us, jabbering excitedly and curiously, and examining the jeeps and our equipment as if we had been men from Mars. The news that the Americans had come and the city was to be surrendered seemed to be spreading quickly. German soldiers who passed on the sidewalks, their weapons slung over their shoulders or about their waists, would stop abruptly at the sight of civilians gathered around the two jeeps, their mouths dropping open in astonishment at the sight of our OD uniforms. They would stare for a moment and casually shrug their shoulders and walk on, as if to say, what a hell of a war. Another group of Americans joined the circle of civilians around the jeeps. Their faces were so pale that I wondered if there was any blood in them at all. Their bodies were thin as though they had done without proper food for many months. All seven walked on crutches. Some had bandages around their feet or legs. Others were amputees. Their comrades were twenty Britishers and Frenchmen in much the same condition. Tears streamed down their faces as our GIs smothered them with cigarettes and K-rations. They had been prisoners of war, some of them since the breakthrough in the Ardennes. We're in the hospital across the street, one of them said. They moved everybody who could walk two days ago, but they left us behind. Whitman and Sergeant Wayland took command of the situation at the gate, and the smiling, smartly uniformed guards opened the gates when Whitman's broken German told them that Der Kommandant had arrived to effect the surrender. I told Harms to come with me, and the other men remained with the vehicles. We passed through the gate and to the rear of the building, past uniformed Germans who smiled insipid smiles at us as we passed. As we neared the entrance to the building, three German officers walked stiffly toward us. The tall one, that's the Major, Whitman said. He's the one who says they'll surrender. The officers were immaculately groomed, their uniforms stiffly pressed and their boots brilliantly shined. The jaunty officer caps sat erectly on their heads, their smoothly shaven faces shining beneath them. I was suddenly conscious of my own shabby appearance. I felt my beard, unshaven in at least a week, my face and hands unwashed for two days, my uniform a dirty, ill-fitting combination, and my combat boots covered with the dust of the city dump. I wondered whether I should salute. I could remember nothing in the army manuals that had described the decorum of accepting a formal enemy surrender, particularly in the stronghold of the enemy. I decided that it would be best to salute anything that closely resembled an officer. I stopped a few paces from the Major, tried my best to make my rough heels click, and found myself imitating the stiff stance of the Germans and flinging a sharp high salute that I hoped showed no element of subservience. The German Major returned the salute and proffered his hand. The move startled me, and he must have seen my discomposure. I had no desire to shake hands with a German officer, but I tried to recover quickly and grasped his hand firmly, if not warmly. He said a few words in German and motioned toward the entrance of the building. I swung into step beside him, and the two lesser officers joined the group that was with me. I found myself unconsciously imitating the stiff military bearing of the Germans, but my shabby appearance must have belied my efforts. The Major led us upstairs. He opened a door on the second floor and motioned for me to enter. I went inside. The room was small but luxuriously furnished with upholstered chairs and a deep rug. An attractive girl and another group of officers rose when I entered. 
The Major began to introduce me to the officers, pausing for me to say my name. I smiled profusely as a substitute for saluting, which I decided would be out of place inside, but I tried to imitate the smart clicking of heels and slight bow of the Germans when they were introduced. We sat down, and the room became a confused jumble of mixed languages. The Major tried to talk to me in German, and when I said Nicht Versteher, he called the girl to translate for him. Her English was weak, so I summoned Harms. Whitman was not content to be excluded from the conversation, and he broke in at intervals with scrambled German and English that made the Germans roar with laughter. His shining face and boyish laughter were infectious, and he had evidently made quite an impression on his first visit. Whitman, to these Germans at least, was a card. The scrambled conversation was getting us no place, so I cautioned Whitman to be quiet. I made out the German major's story from the mixed translations of Harms and the German girl. He and his men, he said, were not German soldiers, even though their uniforms, military customs and weapons were practically identical. They were policemen on the Leipzig police force, 2,500 strong, with 600 quartered at this particular station, the Golis section of Leipzig. The city was filled with displaced persons and German civilians, and they wanted to avoid any fighting if possible. He knew that Germany was kaput, and nothing was to be gained by making a battleground of the city. The commanding general of the police force was of the same opinion, and was willing to guarantee that there would be no fighting by the policemen and civilians, if we would assure them there would be no shooting on our part, and the policemen would retain control of the civilians even after our entry. I began to think that this man was a bit absurd, if he and his superiors only controlled the civilians and the police. There was no guarantee about the Wehrmacht. The commanding general had absolutely no control over the Wehrmacht, I ascertained when I questioned the major. But most of the soldiers had left the city that morning. He did not think we would have much to worry about in the soldiers, but he could not promise anything. I saw my dreams of newspaper headlines fading, and I knew General Eisenhower would be very disappointed in me. These Germans wanted us to say that we would not shoot, but they could not assure us that the German soldiers would not fight. The people were insane. But I was not willing to give up. We argued back and forth for what seemed like hours. Finally, the Major offered a suggestion. I will take you to see the General, Harms translated. He called for an orderly and sent a message for his car, dispatching a second orderly for cognac. The orderly returned with cocktail glasses on a silver tray, and the Major poured drinks around. I decided that I must be quite mad. My wildest dreams had never envisioned a social hour with a group of German officers, and certainly not with the Germans as hosts. The orderly returned shortly with the information that the car awaited us outside. I told Whitman to take charge of the group remaining at the police station until I should return, and we went outside where the chauffeur waited with a luxurious Mercedes-Benz. I climbed into the back seat with Harms and a German lieutenant, and the Major sat up front with the chauffeur. The big car rolled easily across the grounds and out a back gate and around to the front of the police station. The Major turned around and spoke to me in German, pointing to windows high up in the apartment buildings. Civilians were turning on their lights without blackout curtains. The word of the surrender was spreading, for better or for worse. Now the war was surely over for Leipzig. I found myself forgetting my earlier disappointment when I had found that only the police were ready to surrender. Perhaps something could be made of the situation after all. Ist gut, ist gut, the Major exclaimed, laughing and pointing to the lighted windows. Ja, I answered, running the gamut of my German vocabulary. Ist gut, ist gut. The big car rolled easily on as the chauffeur pressed on the gas. Darkness had completely fallen. I had not the slightest idea where we were going, except that I was to confer with the commanding general near the centre of the city. I wondered if we had to pass through any German army defences to reach our destination, but I was not particularly afraid of trouble with German sentries. The police officers evidently commanded the same respect as regular Wehrmacht officers, and I felt relatively safe from the Wehrmacht while in their company. I involuntarily sank lower in the deep back seat, however, when a German sentry stopped us in the middle of the dark street. I wondered what would be his reaction should he see two Americans in the back of the automobile, but he asked no questions. 
He wanted to tell us that it was impossible to go up the street we were following. The Americans were firing artillery. We could not reach the centre of town by this route. The driver turned the big car around and retraced our route toward the Golis police station. Perhaps the telephone lines are not out and we can telephone the general, the major said, and Harms translated for me. Perhaps I could contact American headquarters on my radio and have them stop the artillery fire? From what little I had been able to determine about the direction in which we had been travelling, we had been driving toward the southeast. That would be the 69th Division sector. Getting artillery fire stopped there would necessitate contacting Corps headquarters. I talked with Wes Miller when we stopped again at the police station, however, but he had been unable to reach battalion. First Lieutenant George W. Payne of Indianapolis, Indiana, the battalion intelligence officer, had come into town in another jeep, and he volunteered to return to battalion headquarters to get a stronger radio. We went inside to a large room on the first floor, where the Major said we should wait while he telephoned the General. Lieutenant Whitman was entertaining a group of German enlisted men from the police force, and had evidently not been idle while I was gone. Someone's cognac bottle had suffered. The Germans were fascinated by the Indian head on our 2nd Division shoulder patches. Whitman found a blanket to wrap around his body, and placing his fingers behind his head to indicate feathers, he did a war dance around the room. Me Indian, he cried. Me Indian, woo, 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 woo. The Germans loved it. They laughed uproariously and produced another cognac bottle as if by magic and poured drinks for all of us. Whitman downed his drink in one quick gulp and extended his glass again. The German laughingly obliged. I took out a package of cigarettes and offered one to the officers. They accepted like children accepting candy from a stranger. They felt they really shouldn't, but they wanted to so badly. I could not ignore the hungry looks on the faces of the other Germans in the room, and I remembered that I was in an enemy stronghold, and perhaps it would be best to court their favour in every possible way. I passed the cigarettes around, hoping perhaps a few would refuse, since the package was almost empty, but there were no refusals. My cigarettes were gone. Sergeant Valent brought in three K rations from the jeep. The Germans watched in wide-eyed amazement as he and Whitman opened the K rations and began to eat. Whitman noticed their interest and tossed the extra box to one of the Germans. The others gathered around, chattering wildly. They found a can of chopped ham and eggs and a bar of chocolate in the package. They were wild with delight. Whitman said, A prize in every package! The Major finally completed his telephone call, and Harms and I followed him outside again to the waiting car. I had not the slightest idea how he intended getting past the artillery fire, but he seemed to know what he was doing, and I did not think I was exactly in a position to question his actions. I settled back in the deep rear seat and marvelled at the oddity of the trip two American soldiers riding unmolested through the streets of Leipzig in a Mercedes-Benz driven by a German chauffeur and with two German officers as travelling companions, their jaunty caps silhouetted against the dark windshield. The car rolled slowly down the dark, deserted streets, past a section of town with bomb-gutted buildings and wrecked trolley cars. Debris filled the streets, and the chauffeur drove slowly to avoid large bomb craters in the street. We passed the gutted area, and the buildings thinned out, and I realised we had entered a park. The dense trees growing on either side of the curving road reminded me of the park where my company CP occupied the lone house. I heard a sudden command of, HALT! and saw a soldier standing beside the car, rifle at the ready position. The chauffeur jammed on brakes. For a moment I tried to push deeper into the recesses of the back seat to avoid being seen. Then I saw the shape of the soldier's helmet, and a glint of moonlight revealed the uniform he was wearing. These crazy kraut have driven us smack into our own lines. The soldier sentry was saying something about dismount, and I flung open the back door and jumped out to face the muzzle of an M1 rifle pointed at my stomach. I'm Captain MacDonald, G Company, I said quickly, the words rolling off my tongue in an effort to identify myself before the soldier should shoot. That's 23rd Infantry. I'm with these German officers to try to get the city to surrender. This is my interpreter with me. For God's sake, don't shoot. I talked on until the soldier seemed convinced. This is E Company, Captain he said finally, dropping his rifle to his side. 
They told us at the company CP that you might be through tonight, but I just had to make sure. Thank gosh for that, I said. I don't know what possessed these crazy people to come through our lines. We're headed for the centre of the city. I'd suggest you drive slow, Captain, the soldier said. We've got guards all along this road. F Company is in some buildings just beyond us. I told Harms to ride on the fender of the car. Perhaps that would identify us before someone should shoot. The Major suggested that the German lieutenant ride on the other fender and carry a white flag. I agreed. We climbed back into the car and moved again down the curving street, more slowly than before, expecting at any moment to hear the bark of another sentry. My imagination began to run wild, and I wondered if all the sentries would wait to challenge. Bar and M1 rifles could be deadly weapons. I wondered if we had to pass the Negro platoon from F Company. The memory of what they had done to the German staff car in Hameln beside the Weser River made me shudder. Another sentry on the right of the road yelled, Halt! And I wondered how a man could put so much menace and foreboding into one word. Harms jumped from the fender and was explaining our presence before I could open the back door to join him. The soldier seemed convinced and began to lower his rifle, but another soldier ran from the darkness to join him. Wait a minute, the new arrival said. What the hell? This might be a trick. You'd better make damn sure who this is. I broke into another hurried explanation of who I was and what I was doing. I mentioned the name of every officer in battalion headquarters and E Company. That convinced them, and we climbed back in and on the car and moved slowly forward again. The park changed into another residential district with tall apartment houses, and I knew we must be in F Company's sector. I shuddered again at the thought of what the Negro platoon might do and waited expectantly to be challenged again but not a sound except the steady hum of our motor broke the night stillness. I saw a tank destroyer hunched beside the buildings on the right of the street, its muzzle pointed in the direction we were going. I motioned for the driver to go even more slowly. I didn't want to have trouble with this baby. I held my breath, but no sound came from the TD, and we passed. The car rolled on through the darkness and began to pick up speed again. I exhaled my breath in a long sigh. Strangely, I felt much better. We were back in German territory again. The driver turned up a street to the southeast, and the apartment buildings gave way to fire-gutted public buildings. The Major spoke, and I gathered from occasional words and motions of his hands that we were approaching the heart of the city. Almost all of it had been destroyed by American incendiary bombs. We would soon be at the General's office. The chauffeur turned to the right up a narrow side street, and we found ourselves beneath an arched roof lit by a dim blue blackout light. A uniformed German sentry snapped to attention and raised his right hand in the Nazi salute. Heil Hitler! He opened the door of the car stiffly, and the Major alighted and returned the salute. He indicated the rear door. The orderly opened the door as stiffly as before, and I stepped out. The Major said a few words in German, and the sentry bowed from the waist and opened a door leading into the building on our right. I followed with Harms and the other German officer. We found ourselves in a well-lighted corridor. Guards, stationed at intervals along the walls, snapped to attention as we passed, giving stiff Heil Hitler salutes. The Major and the Lieutenant returned the salutes without stopping. I wondered what the guards thought of the appearance of the two dishevelled Americans, but the stony expressions on their faces told me nothing. A stiff guard at the end of the corridor gave the Nazi salute and indicated that we should follow him, as if he had been specially stationed there to wait for us. He led us up a gracefully curving marble staircase into a room on the second floor. I took in the room at a glance. It was elaborately furnished with a rounded oblong mahogany conference table in the centre, surrounded by cushioned mahogany chairs. The panelled ceiling was high, and the walls were decoratively and elaborately panelled. The floor, again, was marble. The Major spoke to Harms in German and indicated that we should have a seat. He says the General will be with us shortly, Harms told me. I talked with Harms, and the Germans conversed with an orderly. Harms and I shook our heads. If we ever got out of this situation, the others in the company would probably never believe it. The Major barked a command that must have said, Attention, and the General entered. The two officers and the orderly stood stiffly at attention. 
Harms and I rose quickly. I found myself imitating their stiff military stance without intention. The general gave some command, which must have been at ease, and entered the room. I was suddenly conscious of my appearance again. The general was even more immaculately dressed than the others, a long row of military decorations across his chest. His face was round and red and cleanly shaven. A monocle in his right eye gave him an appearance that made me want to congratulate Hollywood on its movie interpretations of high-ranking Nazis. I wondered if I should salute, but the general's outstretched hand told me differently. I shook his hand and mumbled my name. He indicated three other officers and a brown-suited civilian who entered with him. I shook hands around. The civilian, a slim, elderly, grey-haired man who looked like a typical American businessman, explained in English that he was the general's interpreter. Before the war I studied at the University of Chicago, he said in impeccable English that bore only a trace of an accent. When the war began, I was professor of English at the University of Bern, Switzerland. The general motioned us to have seats. Harms and I sat on the right of the table with the German major and lieutenant who had come with us from Golis. The general took his seat at the head of the table, the civilian interpreter on his left, and the other three officers, whom I took to be ranking members of the general's staff, to the left of the interpreter. The general spoke to the waiting orderly, and I caught the word cognac. The orderly clicked his heels sharply and left the room. I thought the Germans were staring at our shabby appearance, so I told Harms to explain that we were combat soldiers and had had no opportunity to dress for the occasion. The general smiled at the statement, and the civilian interpreter informed me that the general had only been noticing that I was quite young to be a captain. I told him, yes, I was a bit young, but age made no great difference in the American army and mentally marked one up for democracy. A pretty girl in a stiffly starched white dress entered with a tray loaded with delicate cocktail glasses filled with cognac. My eyes wandered irresistibly toward her, and the general laughed and spoke to his interpreter. You like the Fraulein, no? the civilian asked. I laughed falsely. The girl smiled shyly and completed placing the cognac before us. The general stood and raised his glass, proposing a toast in German. We all stood and drank. I wondered if I was drinking to long life for Adolf or what, but I drank. The conference settled down to its purpose, and the general talked long and rapidly. The civilian interpreter had to break in at intervals to explain to me what the general was saying. His story proved to be relatively the same as that told me by the major earlier in the evening. He was concerned that there would be no adequate police to control the thousands of displaced persons in Leipzig after the Americans entered, unless we kept his 2,500 policemen in control. He was willing to guarantee that the police and the civilians would not fight if the Americans would enter the city peacefully, leaving the police with their arms and control of the civilians. Again, my hopes of the city's surrender fell rapidly. What about the Wehrmacht? I told him I was willing to leave my men who were at the Golis police station there overnight, if several high German officers would return with me to my battalion headquarters for the night. We would re-enter the city peacefully the next morning, but he must guarantee that there would be no resistance from the Wehrmacht as well as the policemen and civilians. The general shook his head. It was impossible. He had absolutely no control over the Wehrmacht, and at this moment did not know where to contact the commanding officer of the soldiers. He did not think there would be any fighting, however, he added quickly. The most of the German soldiers had already evacuated the city. The conversation went around and around, always returning to the fact that the general could not guarantee there would be no fight from the German army in Leipzig. His situation became quite clear. He was anxious to keep his police in control, but he had attempted negotiations too early. He should have waited until our forces actually captured the city and then contacted our military government officials. I looked at my watch and was surprised to see that it was almost midnight. I wondered if my men at the Golis police station had given me up. No doubt battalion and regiment and maybe General Eisenhower? Considered me lost. I had had no communication with them since we first entered the city at dusk. I wanted to tell the general that the situation was hopeless, but I declined to admit defeat. Also, they might refuse to allow us to return if we said there was nothing we could do about the negotiations. 
I suggested that he and his staff come with me to my battalion headquarters to contact my commanding officer, the colonel. The word colonel seemed magical, and they rose from the table quickly, ready to go. We went back down the curving staircase, past the chant of Heil Hitlers from the guards in the corridor to the outside. The general's open-top car was waiting. He indicated the front seat for me, and an orderly opened the door. The general would drive. The civilian interpreter and one of the staff officers rode in the back of the car, and Harms and the German lieutenant took their places on the fenders of the lead auto. We retraced our route toward F Company's positions. I shuddered again at the thought of what might happen should we run into the Negro platoon, but the prospect of driving head-on into the waiting cannon of the tank destroyer frightened me even more. When we reached especially dark sections of the street, the general would turn on his headlights briefly to get his bearings. I finally could stand this no longer, and I told the civilian interpreter to tell the general that I thought it best not to turn on the lights. The general complied. We were upon the TD almost before I realised we were nearing the F Company positions, but I heard no challenge. We turned off the street onto a four-lane drive, which I knew must be Frankfurter Street, and we reached the Zeppelin Bridge across the Weiss Elster Canal. Still, there was no challenge. We crossed the bridge, past an overturned trolley car which the Germans had used to defend the bridge, and into the sector of the city that lay west of the canal. We were not challenged until we dismounted and reached the door of the battalion CP. The guard recognised me, but was amazed to see me in company with the German officers. I left the officers in the entrance downstairs while I went upstairs to look for Colonel Smith, wondering the while if it would be as simple for a German task force to reach the CP without being challenged as it had been for us. The colonel was asleep. Major Joseph was on duty and did not want to awaken him. I told him my story and added that I did not think anything was going to come of the surrender negotiations. It appeared that my night's adventure had been for naught. I'll go down and talk with them. Major Joseph said. I've got radio communication with your men in Golis now, so call them and have them come on out of the city. If the general wants, I'll send him back to core military government. They're the only people to handle his case. I radioed the message for Lieutenant Whitman to bring his men back to our lines. Wesmiller was on the radio. He seemed irritated that they had to pull out. They were all bedded down comfortably for the night in the police station. I lay down on a sofa upstairs and went to sleep, while the Major discussed the situation with the Germans downstairs. It seemed that I had no sooner closed my eyes than Major Joseph awakened me. I'm keeping the General, the civilian and the staff officers here tonight and sending them on to core military government in the morning, he said. But the General wants you to lead the Major and the Lieutenant back through our lines so they can telephone the General's office to let them know what became of the old man. We secured a jeep from battalion, and preceded the Mercedes-Benz back across the Zeppelin Bridge and through F Company's sector. The E Company guards challenged us again in the park, but I felt safer this time since the jeep was easily recognisable, and they were more easily convinced who I was. I led the officers back to the bombed sector which we had passed earlier and left them there. The jeep driver carried Harms and me back to my company CP in the edge of the park. The two bathrooms in my CP were still being overworked when I returned, despite the fact that it was four o'clock in the morning. The men who had been at the police station had returned, and I talked with Westmiller. We were pretty worried about you, Captain, he said. We thought maybe you had run into trouble. But from his story, I could not see how they had found much time for worry. The Germans had invited them all in for a cognac party in the police station, and except for guards on the jeeps, they had accepted. Whitman had become quite intoxicated and began to insist that it was time for everyone to go to bed and that the German girl who spoke English should sleep with him. Fräulein schlafen mit der Leutnant, he insisted over and over, ignoring the Fräulein's emphatic Nein. Wessmiller and the other men became alarmed. They knew that the Fräulein was the German major's girl and the situation could become quite hostile. One of the other German officers broke the tenseness when he suddenly ordered the Fräulein to schlaf mit dem Leutnant. She seemed to take the order as final and went into a bedroom with Whitman to comply without further protestation. Whereupon Whitman passed out immediately. I crawled into my sleeping bag after a shave and a bath. 
The events of the night seemed ridiculous and unreal, and I wondered how they could have really happened. I saw the headlines which I had envisioned when we first started out on the zany mission fading away into nothing. My eyes closed and I was sinking into delightful sleep. Perhaps later in the day we would attack the city and enter like civilised soldiers, not like fugitives from a lunatic asylum. I slept until noon when I was awakened to talk with a major from the 69th Division. He was on reconnaissance to determine the exact front lines of our division, and I pointed out the dispositions of my company on his map. We had quite a scrap this morning, the major volunteered, over around the city hall, had three tanks knocked out. I said, I was there about midnight last night. The major was amazed. Colonel Smith called at three o'clock and said that orders had been changed and we would continue into the city. Our battalion would occupy the Golis section, and my company would set up around the police station where we had first contacted the German policeman. I alerted the platoons and rode with Lieutenant Reed in the artillery jeep to the railroad bridge across the canal. The rifle platoons were forming there to continue into the city. I assigned sectors around the police station for their occupation and asked Whitman, How was the Fraulein? He grinned sheepishly. The first and second platoons preceded us into town, a single column of men on either side of the narrow road. We hugged the sides of the buildings when we came once again to the narrow chasm that was the street leading to the police station, wary lest we run into defences prepared during the day. But there were no signs of resistance, and the presence of civilians in the streets indicated that there would be none. They seemed less interested in us now than they had been the night before. Evidently they still believed that the city had surrendered last night, and our entrance was anticlimactic. I paused on the street corner outside the building which served as a hospital and talked with the GI prisoners of wars whom we had rescued the night before, only to leave again when we pulled out in the early hours of the morning. I apologised for having to leave them, but they said they knew we would be back. The platoons disappeared into the sectors assigned them, and Lieutenants Loberg and Harms began their search for a CP. The jeeps arrived, and I solicited a ride with Lieutenant Reed and his artillerymen to visit the platoon areas. The second platoon was to go into position to the south of the police station, but I could find no sign of the riflemen, so we drove warily on. An underpass beneath a railroad track loomed ahead of us, two mammoth German railroad guns on the tracks above it. This was supposed to have been the limiting point of my company's advance, but I saw a group of GIs beyond the tracks. They were from the second platoon. We rode up beside them, and I recognised Technical Sergeant Wesley Nye Phillips of Edna, Kansas, the platoon sergeant. I thought you knew not to go past the railroad tracks, I said. Where's Lieutenant Whitman? I know, Captain, Sergeant Phillips replied, but the lieutenant saw all these nice buildings over here and decided to have a look at them. He's gone over to the left to some German barracks or something. I saw Whitman and Sergeant Valent approaching down the street to the left. Something told me I was in for another crazy scheme of some sort, but I steeled myself against becoming a party to it. Whitman spoke before I could begin dressing him down for crossing the railroad. There are sixty Germans and a lieutenant over there who want to surrender. There's a whole big German garrison area, Boku weapons and supplies. I sighed. There was no use pretending. I would end up eventually going over to accept the surrender. It would save time if I gave in without further ado. The lieutenant says they've been waiting to surrender ever since we came in last night, Whitman continued, and he's getting damned tired of waiting, but he wants to surrender to at least a captain. Climb on, I said, resigning myself to the fate that had given me two such zany characters in my company. Tell us where to go. The street ended two blocks away at the German garrison area. A sentry, whom I knew this time to be a member of the German army, stood guard at a massive iron gate leading into the grounds around a group of large three-storey stone barracks and warehouses. Whitman said something to the guard in German, and the soldier clicked his heels, bowed slightly from the waist, and held out the keys of the gate to me. I took the keys and opened the gate. A group of Germans, led by a stiff lieutenant resplendent in a neatly pressed uniform and shined boots, emerged from the nearest barracks. The lieutenant stopped and clicked his heels, saluting smartly as we approached. He nodded his head toward Whitman to indicate that he remembered him. 
I decided to waste no time in this surrender. Either they did or they didn't. Standing in the open area surrounded by hostile barracks on three sides was not to my liking. Tell him to bring all his weapons and pile them here at the gate, I told Whitman. Then he can line up his men and we'll take them on in. The lieutenant acknowledged the order and repeated it to his non-commissioned officers. They saluted smartly and disappeared into the two nearest barracks. A single file of German soldiers carrying rifles, machine guns, panzerfausts and pistols began to emerge from the buildings. They piled the weapons near the gate, and the five men from Whitman's platoon began to break them up against the tree trunks, quickly confiscating the treasured pistols. Soon the task was completed. The Germans lined up in platoon formation with their baggage, and the officer took over from the non-coms. I moved over to stand behind the German officer as he addressed his men, their heads bowed slightly toward the ground, but their bodies stiffly at attention. The lieutenant spoke to them in German, but I could discern from occasional words that he was telling them the war was over for them and they were making an honourable surrender. At his command they should give one last Heil Hitler. The officer barked the command, their heads snapped quickly to attention, and they shouted in unison, Heil Hitler! The officer did an about face and saluted me. He indicated by a nod of his head that I should remove the pistol from about his waist. I did not like the idea of being told how to conduct the surrender, when I was the one supposedly conducting it, but I did not feel inclined to disagree. For all I knew, the other barracks might be filled with Germans, their rifles trained upon us. Also, I wanted the pistol. The men from the second platoon took charge of the Germans, and an orderly placed the officer's bag on the artillery jeep. We climbed aboard and returned to the police station. An order from battalion had prompted Lieutenant Loberg to lock the gates of the police station and put GI guards around the iron fence. The station was now the battalion PW enclosure, and the 600 policemen found themselves prisoners of war. I saw the police major as I deposited the German lieutenant at the enclosure and nodded toward him. He seemed to recognise me, but he was none too cheerful. Two war correspondents were on hand when I returned to my CP. One was an attractive blonde girl whose clear American voice sounded good in the strange surroundings. I heard that you had quite an experience last night, she said. Also, I'd like to get stories on these boys you've rescued here in the hospital. I invited them to spend the night with us, and Harms cleared another floor of German civilians in the apartment house which Lieutenant Loberg had taken over as a CP. I decided that we were one of the few rifle companies in the US Army who could boast of having an American girl spend the night in its CP in such forward positions. She was Lee Miller of Vogue magazine. Darkness was falling rapidly, so we went across the street to a restaurant which our kitchen had requisitioned. The long line of GIs had already formed for chow, and inside the cooks were serving meals to the seven GIs and the British and French who had been prisoners of war in the hospital. I warned them not to eat too heavily for their first meal, but they were too overjoyed at the sight of the food to comply. Almost all of them ended up outside with upset stomachs. As we ate, I heard the approach of hundreds of hobnailed marching feet on the pavement outside. Those hobnailed boots could mean only one thing, Germans. I went outside. A group of GIs were approaching with over 200 German prisoners in marching formation. We're from K Company one of the guards said when I asked. We're on your left. Got these kraut out of a garrison area across the railroad tracks. I shuddered. So these 200 Germans had been watching when I had so unwittingly accepted the surrender of the German lieutenant and his 60 men. Thank God we hadn't been rough with them, I thought. I told the story inside. That's nothing, Captain, Whitman said. Right after you left, we found something sitting right around the corner of one of the barracks that sure made us feel silly, a brand new German tank ready for action. Whitman, I said slowly and forcefully, if you ever decide to accept the surrender of any more Germans, you're going to do so entirely on your own. Is that clear? I've had quite enough. I found three more hungry former PWs waiting for me at my CP when I returned. A 69th Division jeep had deposited the three men from the 1st platoon who had been captured the night the 1st and 2nd platoons were surrounded in bolitz ehrenberg They had been recaptured in the fighting in the southern part of the city that morning. 
The men were none the worse for their capture, except for the lack of food. But the Germans had given them the same food which they themselves received, they said. They did not disturb their watches or other personal belongings, but they had reconfiscated their German pistols. They agreed that the behaviour of their captors was a far cry from the days of the Ardennes, when the German nation had not known its defeat. I was called to battalion the next morning to go on reconnaissance, and with a convoy of four jeeps we travelled over fifty dusty miles to the southeast to a little town on the banks of the Mulder River, a tributary of the Elbe. The Mulder was to be the limit of advance for American forces in our sector. We would relieve elements of the 9th Armoured Division and await contact with the Russians driving toward the west. I returned to the company in Leipzig at dusk and found the entire company in a state of hilarity from the discovery of over 2,000 cases of champagne in the warehouses of the German garrison across the railroad tracks. Sergeant Quinn had found the huge store of champagne and two new Ford trucks. The men from the company had transported what champagne they could by hand, and the two trucks were loaded. To the casual observer walking through the streets that night, the Golis section of Leipzig might have been a dead city, but I knew that behind those blackout curtains a host of GIs were having riotous celebrations. Hundreds of displaced persons had been welcomed into the luxurious apartment houses, cleared of German civilians, and the more attractive Fräuleins had found that it was not necessary for them to evacuate. Non-fraternisation rules were forgotten behind the anonymity of the blackout curtains. Every GI was a king for a night, and his kingdom consisted of girls and champagne and wonderful soft beds and a roof over his head. One man slept with a German opera singer. We moved the next morning and arrived at the little town of Kleinbothen on the Mulder River in mid-afternoon. The 9th Armoured had had virtually no enemy contact since reaching the area, and we settled down to a period of watchful waiting less watchful for Germans than for Russians. Regiment sent out detailed information on markings of Russian armoured vehicles. Supply issued special pyrotechnics to use in the event of appearance of Russian troops. No artillery could be fired without clearance through regiment. A host of war correspondents camped at the regimental CP awaiting the event. Rumours spread like wildfire. A request by the supply section for sizes of dress uniforms brought the widespread speculation that our division had seen its last combat and would be returned to the US to parade down Fifth Avenue on July 4th. An artillery cub observation plane had spotted a column of troops approaching that were without doubt Russians. They were not over five miles away. That news was a rumour, but for truth, a cub plane had spotted Russian tanks ten miles away. The Russians would arrive any day. Lieutenant Bagby went to the aid station to have his ear treated and was evacuated. Lieutenant Speed was one of two officers from the regiment to return to the States on rotation. That left Sergeant Campbell and Technical Sergeant Raymond D. Yardley of Dallas, Texas, in command of the two platoons. Citrone was transferred to battalion and Townsend became my runner and 536 radio operator. Close order drill in the open field behind Kleinbothen fanned the rumour of a New York parade from a spark into a flame. Almost every man hoped secretly that the Germans across the river would throw a few rounds of artillery into the area to stop this close order drill, but we heard no sound of enemy fire. When the Russians did not appear, and rumours were rife that a meeting was coming farther north, regiments sent out motorised patrols far to the front in an effort to contact the Soviet forces. The third patrol brought disaster and an end to the patrolling, when a lieutenant colonel in command of the supporting artillery battalion who went along voluntarily on the patrol, was killed when he fired at a group of fleeing Germans with his .45 pistol. The covey of war correspondents forsook the regiment to move to the north, where the 69th Division eventually made contact with the Russians. Our stock of champagne from Leipzig was quickly depleted, but Sergeant Quinn held out a keg of cognac, which he had rifled from the German warehouses. This was set aside specifically as VE Day material, the rumours of no more combat came to a sudden end on April 30th, when battalion called for a billeting guide. We were being transferred to the Third Army for a drive into Czechoslovakia. We cursed and swore. We knew that a number of divisions had seen no combat since the breakout beyond the Rhine River, and we could not understand why they were not called upon for this mission, but all to no avail. 
We left by truck convoy on a 300-mile journey to the Czechoslovakian border the next morning, May 1st. The ride was harrowing after leaving the north-south autobahn at dark and moving to the twisting, narrow mountain roads of eastern Bavaria. To our amazement it began to snow, and we shivered from the cold in the open trucks. Vehicular accidents and the snow-covered roads delayed the column for hours at a time. The villages we passed were cold and deserted under a blanket of snow, and I was reminded of the sleepy little Belgian villages during the winter campaign in the Ardennes. Dawn was breaking when we finally reached our destination, the little cow town of Burkhartsreith, four miles from the border. I was called to battalion for reconnaissance immediately after breakfast. The falling snow had turned into a needle-sharp rain, and the snow that covered the ground began to melt. The little country trails were almost impassable with ice and slush. Colonel Smith explained that our regiment was to relieve elements of the 97th Division a few miles inside Czechoslovakia the next day. Their defences were concentrated in a series of farming towns, and the sector was almost as quiet as the one which we had left on the Mulder River. The 97th had been making limited objective attacks and found resistance only in the towns, except for heavily mined roadblocks in the extensive woods that were generally undefended. Only one main highway ran through the area, and that along the left flank of our prospective positions. The highway led to Pilsen. Reconnaissance revealed that our defences lay in a broad valley dotted here and there by clusters of white houses with red roofs. A north-south dirt road was the general front-line marker, running parallel almost three-fourths of a mile from a tree-covered ridge which marked the end of the valley. My company, on the left flank, would occupy two picturesque little villages a quarter mile apart, and F Company on our right would be a mile away. The company commander of the unit I was to relieve revealed that he had had three men killed that morning on a patrol against the wooded ridge to the east. There had been no enemy artillery or mortar fire, however, and the road along the front line could be used without danger even by truck convoys. A small church atop a hill between his positions and a German-held town at the edge of the woods to the right front was unoccupied, but a patrol had drawn fire there from the German-held town. The towns were clusters of white and pale blue stone houses, joined by high stone walls and facing on a town square with a small duck pond and chapel. I decided to place my second platoon and a platoon of H Company machine guns in the town on the left, klein Meiderhofen, and the remainder of the company on the right in Usjordvos. We moved by trucks the next morning, a total move of 12 miles. In answer to numerous queries, the colonel eased the non-fraternisation restrictions, allowing us to live in the houses with the civilians, although we were in the Sudetenland, and the civilians were German in speech, customs and sympathy. We settled down comfortably, but a bit crowded in the two little towns. I was well pleased with the situation, except for the fact that we were so spread out. Regiment did not seem anxious to attack, and our mission appeared to be merely protection for the left flank of the Third Army's drive to the south. My only worry was that battalion would order patrols, and such a step seemed foolish, risking men's lives needlessly when radio reports told us daily of fresh surrenders of masses of German troops throughout the combat area. The war was surely almost over. The tranquillity was broken after dark, however, by a call from battalion. The 3rd Battalion was dissatisfied with their positions and wanted to move forward approximately two miles. That would necessitate our battalion attacking to take the first row of towns beyond the wooded ridge to our front. I must send out a patrol at daylight the next morning to find a route through the woods to our front. I chose the 1st Platoon to furnish the patrol, and Sergeant Campbell and Staff Sergeant Matthew P. Butwina of Cleveland, Ohio, the squad leader of the squad Campbell had chosen, reported to my CP. The patrol's mission was to investigate a trail which the map showed to run through the woods from a point almost halfway between our location and the town occupied by the second platoon. Accomplishing the mission would probably be simple once the men had crossed the wide open space to the woods line, but crossing that open space was the problem. The patrol would leave the next morning at four o'clock, thus providing a cover of darkness to reach the woods. I told Campbell to provide the squad with one 536 radio, and he could maintain an outpost in a small, round patch of firs between the town and the main woods, 
with another 536 radio and the light machine guns to provide supporting fire if necessary. Lieutenant Reed gave the patrol leader an overlay of artillery concentrations he had plotted by firing during the afternoon. I left instructions with the man on telephone guard to awaken me when the patrol was ready to start out the next morning. It was cold when Fulton awakened me, but the rain had stopped and a half-moon was shining dully through rapidly vanishing clouds in the sky. The patrol waited outside the house. Fulton would operate a 536 radio at the CP to keep in contact with the outpost in the patch of fir trees. I wished the men good luck and they moved out into the dark. Fulton warmed me a cup of coffee. Campbell reported all clear from the patch of firs. The patrol squad was moving on. Campbell described the squad's route to the woods line as a shallow, open draw extending almost to the woods. He said it was beginning to get light. It was almost daylight when I heard the first sound of small arms fire in the distance. I had been unconsciously listening for it through the long minutes of waiting, but when it came I was startled by the suddenness of it and its dread portent. Fulton contacted Campbell on the radio, but the transmission came through weakly. He ran from the house to the edge of town, and I opened up a fourth 536 to receive his relayed message. The patrol has hit small arms fire from the edge of the woods, he relayed, but the enemy disappeared across a low rise and Campbell can't see him. He's lost contact by radio. I thought perhaps the weakness of the batteries in Campbell's radio made him unable to reach the patrol, but Fulton ran forward to exchange radios. He still could not contact Sergeant Butwina. Only an occasional burst of distant automatic fire broke the morning stillness. There seemed to be nothing to do but wait. Perhaps Butwina could send a messenger back to the outpost. That would seem to be easier than trying to send a messenger to reach him when we did not know his position. An hour passed slowly. I called Sergeant Campbell again and again for information, but he had none. I could picture the men in the patrol squad hugging the damp earth in the open drawer, unable to shift their bodies in any direction lest they draw fire from the enemy in the woods to their front. If only we knew where to fire artillery, I thought. We could either enable them to move forward or support them in a withdrawal. But it would be too dangerous to fire artillery in the vicinity without knowing the exact location of the squad. I called battalion to send 2TD to give supporting fire and I was on the verge of calling for the entire 3rd platoon to move out to assist them when Sergeant Campbell called me over the radio. Between us back, Captain, he said. He made it out with one other man. Says his scouts were almost in the woods before the kraut opened fire, and now all of them are pinned down in the open. One of his scouts is pretty badly wounded, 